Ebola, Nipah, Hendra, Marburg, maybe COVID, all of these viruses and many of the world's other scariest diseases all have one thing in common. It's freaking bats. It's Halloween, so we gotta talk about it. Why are bats such harbingers of doom? If so deadly, why friend-shaped? Bats are incredibly unique in that they are the world's only flying mammal. That means they are covered in hair, they give birth to live young, they lactate to feed said young. But on top of that, they've got wings. And that uniqueness is the key behind this problem. Because you see, bats are really great reservoirs for disease for two main reasons. One, they like to snuggle. So sue them, they're snuggly. No, the reason this is a problem is because massive amounts of them are roosting in very close contact together for extended periods of time. And that means that this is the ideal scenario for pathogens to pass from individual to individual. And every time a virus can get into a new individual, it's a new opportunity for some remix of its DNA to make it better at surviving in more hosts. And two, because bats are mammals, they're similar enough to humans in their cellular machinery that it means that the viruses that like to live in bats and can live in bats can relatively easily make the leap just over that genetic hurdle to then also be able to infect humans. You can basically think of bat populations as giant bubbling cauldrons full of potential human pathogens. Now the final key to this puzzle and the reason that the bats themselves don't get sick from these viruses that they are harboring inside their bodies is that unique selling point. Bat USP, if you will, the flying. Flying is a really metabolically taxing thing to do. Like, it takes a lot of energy to be able to fly. I wouldn't know because I can't do it. I'm not mad about it. And because flying takes so much energy, you can basically think of all of the metabolic pathways and cellular machinery inside of a bat's body as basically like on hyperdrive. But the thing about cellular pathways is that they produce waste. So cellular pathways on hyperdrive means like hyper amounts of cellular waste accumulation, which can do damage to cells and DNA. But because bats gained the ability to fly probably about 64 million years ago by our best guess, they are flying pros. Which means they've had lots of time to evolve specialized DNA protection and repair mechanisms. Basically, you can think of it as like if the bat's DNA is code, they have installed very advanced malware protection. And that's important when it comes to viruses because viruses have to invade your cells. They then basically co-opt your genetic replication machinery to be able to reproduce themselves. Kind of like lazy little pirates. The bat's advanced malware protection also has the added bonus of protecting them from viruses. So yeah, the viruses can get in their bodies and in their cells and replicate enough to like evolve and jump from individual to individual, but this inbuilt cellular and genetic protection mechanism of a bat's metabolism keeps them from getting so sick that they would die from the virus. And that's key. Because when we talk about infectious disease, a successful pathogen, if you want to put it that way, makes you sick enough that you pass it on to someone else, they get it and it replicates in their body and they get sick enough that they pass it on to someone else, but not so sick that you would be too sick or die before you were able to pass it on to a nice number of people. If an illness is too severe in an individual, it can become self-limiting within a population. So bats, with their extraordinary ability to protect themselves from these viruses, are really ideal for those viruses to populate, evolve, replicate, spread, and eventually jump ship into another species. And an added complication is that ultra-fast metabolism that allows for flight also makes bats really hot, temperature-wise. And that means that a lot of viruses that infect bats actually end up getting totally killed off, like they're literally heat killed by the body's bat temperature. The body's bat temperature. No, no, wait, bats body temperature. Eh. Now that's great news for the bat, but what it means is that the only viruses that are left are viruses that can survive extreme temperatures past 100 degrees, and therefore are also capable of surviving a human fever. That has always seemed so messed up to me. See, when you get a fever, it's actually not the pathogen itself making you warm, it's your body's immune reaction to the pathogen. Basically, your body's immune system is like, I don't know how to get rid of you, we're literally gonna burn the burn you out. We're gonna smoke you out. It's gonna get too hot in here for you to succeed. And the viruses that can survive bad body temperatures are like, yeah, it's not really, it's not really doing much for us. I'm not really feeling the heat. I don't really care. Your human cells, though, don't love it at that temperature. They are not thriving. Anyway, I digress. The point is, I love bats. I really do. I think they're such amazing animals and they're really misunderstood. Because yes, unfortunately, they can be very dangerous reservoirs of disease that can make humans sick. But also, there's only really a high risk when humans are pushing more and more and more into places that we haven't been before. One of the more common ways for bats to spread a disease to humans is say maybe a bat is chowing down on a fruit snack. That fruit or fruit near it falls to the ground that's been exposed to the bats, maybe saliva or other secretions. Humans harvest it, come 
come into contact with it, ingest it, bada bing, bada boom, infection. Or say we're farming animals in an area where bats are common and those animals that we're farming are coming into contact with bat droppings. Another route of infection. So really, human encroachment on previously wild spaces or displacement of native animal populations is not only key in environmentalism, conservation, biodiversity science, but is also a cornerstone, an essential one, of infectious disease and world health. Anyway, that got kind of serious, so I will leave you with a fun fact. Vampire bats do indeed drink blood, which is another route of infection for other mammals, by the way. And while they do use echolocation to find their way around in the dark and to know where things are, they also have a very specialized heat sensing organ in and around their nose, and that's the way they can sense your warm, pulsating blood. To locate you, swoop down, pierce your skin with their two little fangs, and then lick up your blood. Infinitely creepy, and also very cute. They're also really social and they take really good care of their babies and they even watch other bats' babies while those bats go off and hunt. They have like bat daycare. Freaking bats, man. Happy Halloween. <laughs>